talking just now, and then I will start reading my lesson script. That is the. I have started the recording of in Teams. Yes, ex excellent. Thank you, Frank. Frank. Um, yes, today we want to talk about uh, a few things. Uh, first, a bit about uh, the practical uh, exercises, and then also about uh, how effectively use your IDE, because I've seen that uh, a few students. Uh, don't get the optimal uh, um, functionality of the of their IDE, and that's something that you, you would uh, like to change. So to do that, I'll I'll show you what uh, what we do. Um, when I show this, you can also look at this bottom right uh, thingy here that shows my mouse movements. For instance, now you see that I press uh, left the um, the primary mouse button, and this is the uh, secondary mouse button. I can also scroll up and down. And if I press my shift key or control key or alt key or uh, sorry, the, this is the function key, the meta key actually, and this is the alt key. So yeah, that you can see that uh, uh, when I uh, am uh, working my, with my IDE. But before we do that, uh, we'd like to go a bit, little bit into the details of um, uh, our project, or our homework actually, that's what I should say. And to do that, you should look at this uh, screen. And here you see, can see the dashboard that we are interested in. And from the yellow boxes, we can see that the students have been active within the last eight hours. So some people are still working on some exercises. And uh, the good thing is that uh, at least this morning, 61 students uh, completed the exercises for week one, which is just within the deadline, that's nice. But it also implies that quite a few students, because we have a total 152 students in this collection, didn't do that. And um, I hope I can infer that the new students, that the first semester students, or I should say the first year students or the second semester students, complied with the exercises, so executed them. And uh, that is a good thing, but uh, be aware, be aware that, and those students already gained a little bit of uh, points uh, towards the uh, uh, gr final grade. They, they get one twelfth of one point uh, towards our grade. But the most important thing, and that is something that is easily forgotten, is that if you make sure that you uh, do the work of an exercise uh, almost immediately, so best would be in the week that the lesson has been given, you will also be able to ask the questions that are relevant to not, not just you, but also to the other students and you will be able to keep up the pace of this PLC2 course because the pace is quite high. We know that, that this has been uh, this uh, the case all uh, in all years, but um, that is um, something that you uh, should uh, reckon with. So it would be best if you try to uh, make the exercises uh, for this week in this week, although the, net, the, the deadline is uh, two weeks uh, away from the current point, because that, uh, that helps uh, us and you, and you'll be able to ask the relevant questions during the practical session. I found it a bit peculiar that uh, I've uh, contacted quite a few students in this list that have a, gr uh, a, a black bullet, and a black bullet means, or the black dot here, that black circle, it simply means that they didn't commit any, uh, anything of the exercises, and that is strange, and if I ask them, is there anything wrong, why didn't you do anything, then they say they have no problems, but I'm almost certain that he never tried to, to commit stuff. And if that runs, if you run into problems with that kind of stuff, please don't try to ask us in, in, in the weekend we, because we are simply not available. We have also need our week, uh, weekend to uh, recover from, uh, um, well, sometimes a tiring week. Um, okay, go back in, going back to my uh, lesson script, which I want to keep a bit private, uh, a bit private, that would be in this screen, yes. Did you start your own recording, uh, Peter? Or? Uh, no, Frank did, and I also did start my own rec recording, yes. Right. So that is uh, that should be, uh, should, should be uh, fine. The next thing I'd like to show you is uh, effective use of your, um, uh, of your IDE. And for that, again, I want to point to this uh, small component at the bottom. It's called KM Caster. You can find it on GitHub, uh, maybe also in the repository of your op operating system. Uh, it's a Java program that you need to compile with Java 14, as it happens to be. 
It uh, runs on my machine and it allows you to uh, allows me to show you what I do with my IDE. And to uh, make that effective, I'd like to show you the IDE itself with a semi demo program. And what I will be doing is just uh, using the keyboard controls to to get stuff working in this uh, in this case. What I and I also uh, implicitly show you a bit of my practice how I develop a program. Quite often, um, I uh, use try to use final fields. Uh, the exact reason that is something that I will not tell in this demo because that is, well, then uh, that would also take too much time. But what I typically do is I make final fields and of course give them a type because that is required in Java and give them a name. And in this case, name itself is sufficient. And you already see that uh, the IDE has something as a remark or um, uh, a bullet point. Uh, it says, well, you have a final field here, but that must be initialized. And the only way that you can initialize is either do it at, at the spot, uh, so where I currently am, but also uh, I can do that in the constructor. Now, making a constructor is relatively simple. If you do Alt and Insert, then you see that you get something equivalent to source insert code. That is the same thing. In my IDE, it is, or uh, in my operating system, I should say, it is alt insert. If you can't remember these things or want to know what these things are in your, on your machine, you could look at the help keyboard shortcut uh, card, which is a PDF file. And that PDF file, you could print that for instance, or keep it uh, separate. And you could uh, try to study the, study the thing or uh, look at, um, or, or look at, uh, you can't see it. This is, here, here you go. Or simply try to use one of these, uh, these um, shortcuts, which are interesting for your case. For instance, there are um, keyboard completions for public. Uh, you can do something like Control F and all these things, compile package, build main project and whatnot. Talking about building and using this uh, menu, uh, this, me this top menu, um, I also gave a few students that's, that's something that I forgot in my instance, but that's good because now I can demonstrate how you can uh, improve your um, uh, experience with the IDE a little bit. You can add icons in this list and to make them relevant for you. What I in particular like is this one, which opens the terminal inside the project, but that is not the most important part. I want you to get things back that you are, were familiar with in the MOOC. And to do that, you must go to View, then Toolbars, and then cu Customize. And in Customize, you must scroll until you find something like, uh, let's see what the chapter actually is. It's inside a project top. So you have here multiple tops. It's also a tree-like structure. Look into Project. And in that project, in particular, um, to make the uh, MOOC experience uh, come back again, you could add Test File to your menu and you simply do that by drag and drop and I tend to put that in front of this hammer symbol. The hammer is simply built. There's also a hammer and a broom. Actually the broom is applied first, that is about clean and then the hammer is about uh, building again. And I also uh, add test project and I put that after, so uh, right off uh, test file and once I've done that I can simply click these when I have selected a test file. I haven't done that yet, but you can see that you can optimize or improve your, your menu in this case. Um, let's go back to the demonstration. You see, still see that the IDE is here complaining about a final field with, which hasn't been initialized. So I must uh, make sure that that file, the final field is initialized. And how do I do that? By simply adding a constructor and that constructor will automatically select the fields that are final, that need to be initialized. So in this case, this checkbox, you can uh, turn it off if you want to, but uh, typically it's, it's, it is checked. And if I click now uh, generate, and you'll see the IDE uh, gladly inserts um, um, a constructor with the proper uh, type and name and whatnot, so that uh, the class now is uh, completely compliant with what the compiler would like to see. The same is about adding um, more methods. There are two variants of methods, um, and you do that by again by Alt Insert, for Deutsche Alt Einfügen uh, on a Windows keyboard. Um, but you, what you can now do, for instance, uh, create a getter, 
and then it will show you all the fields for which you can uh, gen generate getters. Of course, I only have one field, so in that case, uh, that is the only thing that is being shown. So I click on that, and then generate, I will see you get, I, I get a getter. You will also see that if I do Alt Insert, that uh, now this getter, this getter possibility is uh, gone, because there is no more field that needs to, needs to have a getter. You also ha would have seen that there is no setter uh, offer in this case, for the simple reason that setting is not possible on the final field, so that wouldn't have any, um, any use. About uh, another uh, important aspect, uh, typically methods that you want to overwrite are the um, hash code and equals method. And in that case, don't uh, overwrite or insert them. I'll first give you a demonstration how you could do it in the wrong way. So for instance, uh, I want to uh, overwrite the hash code, uh, the hash code and the equals method. If I would do it in like this, then you will have the effect of not implementing the hash code and equals for the simple reason uh, that this uh, method itself uses the already existing implementation in the superclass. In this case, that is object. So doing it by overriding hash code and equals is the wrong choice that you uh, that I made. Uh, and in this case, I made it um, intentionally. What you sh should do if you want to uh, use uh, hash code and equals, simply select this, this pair, equals and hash code. And then you will see that the IDE pops uh, with a new uh, pop-up window or a dialog in which it offers the fields that you want to consider in your hash code and equals. And in all cases, if you select one in the equals method, you must also select that, that, that one in the, um, in the hash code method because otherwise uh, hash code and equals will not play nice with hash maps. Um, so you see that uh, there's a hash code uh, generated. Uh, simply accept it as it is. You do not have to change it. There's also an equals. You do not have to change it, although the IDE makes something with, on which itself has a suggestion to improve it a little bit. I tend to click on this uh, light because that makes the uh, method a bit shorter but not really, uh, not really that much. So the original and now this small modification is equivalent, so there's no, uh, no uh, real effective change. And the last one that I'd like to show you is the toString method. Um, it's quite often nice to have a toString because it helps you in testing and debugging and whatnot. Uh, and in this case, you can uh, simply use what, uh, what the IDE uh, uh, wants to create. But for instance, if you don't like it, uh, what is generated because well the only thing that I really want to have is the name of the thing then you can of course return uh, remove everything that is uh, not not required by you so you have seen that uh, I use uh, control and alt and shift uh, that depends all on uh, the operating system that you have Windows and Linux all use the original uh, IBM QA standard um, for some reason, uh, Apple wants to deviate from that. That's fine, but uh, you have to look up uh, d different uh, keyboard controls, and, and well, that's uh, that's uh, that's life. Um, yes. Um, then uh, a few things on the practical exercises um, in uh, the um, in the MOOC. No, not in the MOOC. Sorry. In the practical exercises, and let me show. Uh, the practical exercises again. You'll see that let's well so let's simply well go to any random student. So uh, yeah, Jonas probably has completed the exercises. Let's go to this uh, phone book exercise. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, Ninety-six percent as coverage, and we have a phone book here and uh, get by name. Mm, yeah, that is that is also uh, quite nice. You'll see you see that uh, if I look at the uh, phone book exercise that uh, Jonas did, then you see that the coverage in his case with his own tests are 97%, uh, meaning that he uh, tested almost all the stuff except this one. If you write such code, uh, such code which does an early return chances are that this last statement, and it's certainly this curly brace, is not executed. Now you might ask, what, is, what does it mean, not executed? It simply says that that loop has never been taken. If you want to make sure that that line is also taken, 
make sure that your uh, your loop at least uh, completes once uh, unsuccessfully because then this loop back or this jump back is uh, executed and the last statement return nil is never used because obviously in the tests you only have the lucky cases that is you only look up uh, names that are really that you expect to be in the in the dictionary or in the book entry and then you will never return with line number 45 in this case and uh, if you want to execute line number 45, simply uh, look up um, um, a book entry be, uh, uh, using the method get by name by, by using, um, uh, by using uh, a value that you know by cer uh, for certain isn't, uh, isn't in um, uh, the, the collection or in the hash map or whatever implementation that you uh, took. Um, that's that about... Um, Back to uh, go back to my uh, oh no 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 that is not too good simply get my index back and then like this so that is uh, what I would like to show about coverage. Um, some students uh, made a remark that in, um, the, in the, the minibar exercise there is a barkeeper class which is completely untested in the teacher test. Well, there is an oversight by me because I should have removed this barkeeper class. And if you come into such a, si a situation where you notice, hey, the teacher test don't, keep, uh, don't test this barkeeper class at all, the best solution is simply remove that class. And if you would have known that beforehand, of course, then you would have done that. But now you might have tested this uh, uh, barkeeper class uh, in every, any uh, way you like, but there is no specification for the barkeeper. And that is also a hint towards, well, if there's no specification, probably no one is, uh, is interested in these things, so throw it out. That also happens, by the way, when uh, the business code doesn't really use a two-string method. If you have a two-string method that is not used and also not used by your test, simply remove it or at least comment it out so that you can re-enable it when you want to test something. But don't write code that is not required by any test. So if you have a test that tests a method, then you know the test is to, uh, needs to be there. But if you find that some methods are introduced somehow because, well, the IDE offered to make something like a two string or an equals a hash code method, and you do not really need them and use them in your, uh, in your tests, remove them. That is the easiest way to get the coverage really high. The other thing about testing is not just about coverage, but also about eff effectivity of tests, of, or effic efficacy, I think is the proper word, uh, is and how can I show that uh, testing is uh, effective? That is, does the test indeed prevent uh, errors to happen? Uh, and that would mean that if the business code is broken, so I'll show that you don't add on uh, the simple queue implemented by group number uh, 67. Uh, if um, if the, the tests, uh, if you break the business code and the tests don't discover that the business code is broken, then of course the test is flaky because the test should find these, uh, these uh, broken parts. There is a tool for that and that tool is called PIT testing and that, test, that tool is already available in your project. It's simply uh, a component or a plugin, I should say, uh, inside your Maven definition in SEBIPOM in particular. And what you need to do in that case is select, uh, select the project on which you work, then go to your uh, configuration and select PIT. That stands for PIT testing. What the exact name is, I don't uh, That means I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't care in this case. Probably it is not very um, um, nomic. At least, it, I don't know, doesn't matter. But if you have, um, have chosen this configuration, let's, let, let, us, let me simple, uh, let's simply demonstrate that completely. Now here you see all that is possible with the default configuration that you have for this project. So if I look at the configuration, my project configuration, first click on the project, then you can change the configuration. You see all kinds of configuration settings. 
Uh, one of them is, for instance, Yakoko. You might already have seen that uh, when you run your own uh, coverage test locally. You can also select PIT. And if I do that, you see that this menu changes because these are all the Maven targets. Now, if I want to use the PIT plugin to uh, create a test report that checks if the tests discover problems that are introduced by this framework into your business code, then you can uh, run it as follows. First of all, you need to do PIT test mutation coverage. That is actually what it does. It mutates your business code uh, to see and uh, to trying to introduce errors and then runs your test on that mutation. And then there's another mutation and runs your test on that mutation and does it rather quickly and rather uh, efficiently on, on the machine. So the first thing you need to do is execute that goal. And you see that uh, some things are done. It finds a test in this class. It does some uh, mutation coverage. And then it, it takes a bit of time because it uh, what it does, and let's see, it generated 13 mutations of your business code. So 13 variants of your uh, business class. T ran the tests on all of these and uh, tried to find if there are any errors in particular, it wants to see if the test class detects the errors that have been introduced. Now to look at that, you need to look at the uh, pit test report. So you, what you need to do is execute that goal next. And that is rather quick because the information that is collected by the first phase is now turned into an HTML report. And you can find that uh, HTML report inside the folder pit, pit reports. And there you see um, uh, folders that have the uh, timestamp, date timestamp. And you see the second one that is now, it's now, what is it? Uh, 20, 21, 03. 1321 that is about the time of this moment so if i look into this uh, file i'll see an index file what you need to do is not click on it because then you see uh well html as source code the best is to simply view it and then uh, view it in uh, your uh, one of your browsers the browser that you prefer and in this case it is uh, google chrome obviously and in there you can see um, that you have a pit uh, test report, this bit test coverage report, How it is, what is it called? And here you see which lines have, have not been detected as being faulty. For instance, in such a red line, and if I point at that, uh, that one, it says removing the call of system out print line had no effect on the test. So that change in your modification um, is one thing. And of course, this is obvious because the test itself doesn't look at standard output. And that doesn't detect if you do system out or you don't uh, do system out. And that is uh, the case. The important other example here in this case is the way that this student set up his tests, uh, or rather his class, is actually quite good. Because what he does, um, inside the peak method, he does a, a test and says if it's empty, then I'll throw an exception. And the same he does for the take method. If it is, is exception, is, uh, it does an, uh, an empty. And then what you see here is um, a, has the, a test for has next, um, if not has next. And it's, that is also, wait a minute, that is also almost, well, similarly enough at, at least, um, executed or verified by this test. And in this case, you could argue that this test is not really necessary. If you tell the user of your queue please only get elements from it when you, uh, when you know it's not empty, then, um, then you do not really need this. So you could uh, either, um, uh, again, do this has next test and do the same thing. But if you want to test uh, that this has effect, then you should, of course, try to f fetch an element from, uh, from uh, your queue uh, to make this uh, code part uh, the trigger so that you test that indeed a value is, is being returned. Because in this case, this, uh, 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 this condition is uh, simply ignored. And then in this case, you see that the test uh, resulted in a timeout. That is what can happen if you try uh, an infinite loop. Um, and that is also what, uh, what this test uh, tries to prevent. Anyway, that is about uh, pit testing. And uh, the next 
part in my lesson would then be uh, let me look let me look actually the the real topic of the lesson and there are a few pictures that I have uh, made in, in addition to what is on the website so let me simply uh, start with that and that is also in this browser what is dependency injection all about or I should actually say dependency inversion it has to do with design not so much with coding but more with design what you want to do is you want to in your design phase you want to identify what business classes that you have the idea that of course when you uh, work test driven uh, that you want to test driven develop that business class but in very many cases those business classes use services and if they use services without you uh, you as a test class um, being able to intervene between the business class and the implementation of such a service you can't observe what this business class does with this service. And you did something that you don't want. For the simple reason, you do not know what the business class does with the service, what it reads from the service, or what it writes back to the service, without you as a test class being able to observe what, uh, what is happening. To improve that, and I remember, my, I remember that there's a bit more text. Oh yes, that's below the picture. To uh, avoid this problem, this is a very simple trick. Uh, what you do, you start with defining an abstract service. And the abstract service is, well, uh, as abstract as you can go, is defined as an abstract class, or better even still, as an interface, which is an, uh, a Java class or a type, as you know, which has no implementation. It only has signatures, meaning method names with parameter lists and return values. That is the way in which you can define a service. And such a service can then be uh, used by the business class as, as long as you provide an implementation. And in real life, that implementation would be, for instance, uh, a REST service or a database service or uh, some kind of other uh, service like a file service or an, a system service or whatever that you can imagine for your uh, application that is indeed uh, used by, uh, by the application, by the business class in this case. So if you allow yourself, uh, instead of having this dependency in which the business class itself would do new service and simply use that service in, in any way it would like, instead you create your business class in such a way that you can provide an instance of that service to the constructor. Typically you pass that in using a constructor. You cannot see that over here inside the constructor let me let me make it a little bit bigger inside the constructor uh, you see that uh, an instance of that service is being supplied yeah so uh, i should have written a service over there because that's the name here but this is what happens in uh, my constructor and over here you see that uh, the constructor of this business class simply creates a new service you don't know what version of, of service it takes because you have no control as a test class in this case however in a test scenario, you know that the test itself creates the instances of the business class. And when it is doing that, it will call the constructor on that business class. And it can now provide an implementation for that service to the business class. Which allows this uh, test class to provide the business class with a specific version of that uh, test so that the, uh, the collaboration between the test class and that special service implementation can then observe exactly what the business class being, uh, is doing. And it talks that uh, sounds a bit uh, theoretical, um, and um, well, it might be, but you'll see uh, uh, exact implementations and uh, examples for that in the remainder of the lesson, and of course, in the exercises for this week. Let's, uh, let me give, go through the list of things that you do and don't want. Uh, for instance, uh, you, and uh, read test class for that, want to observe what is going on because you want to know what goes in the uh, method uh, in the business class and what comes out of the business class and what the business class uses its services for. You want to also make sure that the business class does exactly the things that you want it to do. For instance, retrieve a value from uh, the service 
or save a value into the service or use a printer and print exactly what you expect it to print or at least have the, the, the things that you expect to be printed like if you're printing a cash receipt or a receipt for uh, a an, an belake, uh, a bon, um, what do you call that, uh, um, a cash uh, register um, transcript you would like to see the, the product names, uh, maybe the prices and the amount of product that you purchased. So with all this, this, this kind of information, that is, that is something that you want to see on your cash receipt. And that is something that should be provided by the, by the business class. And when you make sure that the service that you provide with the business class can tell you what information has been provided by the business class itself, you can simply observe if the business class does its computation right before even it's, it's sent to a real printer or even before it's sent to a real database. You can check that the proper methods are being called. You can uh, uh, check that the proper information is transferred by the parameters of this method. And what you also can avoid now is that you're not just testing the business class, but actually also the implementation of the service. And uh, that has uh, two um, consequences. First of all, if you do not have to test the, the implementation of the service, you can avoid uh, going to a database or to a REST service, which may be slow or maybe down or maybe uh, not available or even might be used by a colleague of you who is doing other tests and you do not want to interfere with that, those tests. So uh, avoiding uh, to use the, the actual service uh, in, in the test of the business class can focus your test really, really well on your uh, business class. Um, you also do not want to uh, go to the database and to see if the business class indeed inserted everything that you expect to be inserted in the database because, well, if it's a database and uh, if a database is needed, it isn't even uh, in a set of requirements of the business uh, class. It might be that your business class uh, simply assumes that this, uh, in this case, this abstract service is just about uh, uh, saving stuff. But how that saving is uh, takes place, if it's a da real database and what kind of database it is, or maybe it's a REST service or a website uh, lookup or a website uh, upload or whatever, um, that doesn't really matter because the, doesn't, the business class doesn't really care. It only knows that this abstract service uh, is, for instance, for saving and retrieving stuff, looking up stuff, but how that's implemented, that is not, uh, not important. Another important reason, but not the, maybe not the most important reason, is that you want your tests to run really fast. And uh, by having uh, a specific implementation for your test, a very, uh, an implementation that you can very easily make by means of the, the, uh, the library that is already pop um, popping up, uh, like here, uh, you ma can make your uh, uh, test run very fast. So your test can run uh, uh, within uh, less than a second or maybe a tenth of a second or something like that. So if you have a bunch of tests, you want to run them all uh, quite quickly so that you know that these tests uh, are still compliant or the um, business code is still working as you expect it to be. And, um, and the other, the last thing maybe is um, in coverage, you've seen that sometimes it's quite hard to reach certain uh, branches in your uh, in your code. For instance, when uh, exceptions are being thrown or special, very special cases. In this case, when you have a special uh, implementation of your service, you can exactly feed the business code with the instances of a entity class, for instance, that you want. You want maybe uh, to have it uh, special characters or um, uh, other specific values like uh, an age that doesn't comply with uh, normal expectations. Um, a, a life user goes in that is 150 years old uh, looking at his birth date. That would of course be, be strange and then see if your business code reacts to that in a, in a proper way. So that is, that is what you can easily do with, uh, with these kind of special uh, classes, with these um, helper classes, these helper implementations. Now, um, that is about why you would like to do, um, first of all, this, this dependency inversion. So uh, making sure that instead of having the business class directly talk to some kind of implementation of a specific service, having it talk to an abstract um, uh, definition of the same service and uh, then being able to provide a real service uh, when, the, uh, when the business class is run in the application but a specific service when the business class is run in the test environment. 
Okay. Um, to do that, uh, we will use in this course, we will use Mokito, which is a mocking library. And it's one of the most popular mocking libraries in, uh, in the Java world. And that's what we will be doing. And uh, the idea is actually quite simple. What you do is Mokito makes you a special version of uh, the class that needs to be used. And those classes are called docs or dependent on components. And you see that in this picture, you here you have your business class. That is a system under te test. That is what this uh, SUT means. It uses some dependent on component and in that um, in that definition, which is a non-final class or uh, an abstract class or an interface, uh, Mokito is able to generate an implementation specific for your test. And that implementation works in a way that you can train that implementation exactly what you want it to do or how you want it to react in this test uh, scenario. A few years back when we was, were still uh, allowed uh, on, the, on the campus, I should, I've shown that in, in class, and I uh, uh, fetched a student from, uh, from the benches and said, come over here, I'll have to, do, have to instruct you. And I whispered in, in his ear, when I say hello, then try to hit me, try to hit me in the face. Now, of course, he knew that uh, if he really hit me, then <laughs> he wouldn't be in trouble, but he understood uh, the game, and that is what you do. You instruct something like an extra, extra uh, as in a movie, you instruct them to do something special, like walk in with a tray or something. In this case, uh, do a specific interaction, react in a specific way on a call that is being done by uh, the business class. So what you do is you tell this, um, this uh, mock, you tell it exactly what to do. So when this action hap happens, then do this. For instance, return a specific value, return value Pietje Puck with uh, this birth date, that is uh, a, a, a possibility. You can do it, could also make it throw an exception to, so that the business class can be tested. What happens if the business class uh, gets a, an exception for this call? And then you can test how this business class interacts. Once this business class has done its thing, has uh, executed this action on uh, the dependent on component, you can then ask this this dependent on component, this uh, mock, you can ask it, what happened? Did this business class really ask you for this method? This, this, did this interaction occur? So that is the most important part for which you use mock, mocks. Because you can train a mock, tell it exactly what to do when a certain method is called, or even multiple methods are being called, then do the interaction in which you uh, expect that the business class does the interaction with the dependent on component or with, even with multiple dependent on components so that you can verify that the interaction that you wanted to occur did occur and also that an interactions you didn't want to occur don't occur. So there are two sides of this metal. Uh, some interactions should occur and other interactions should not occur and that is what you simply can ask on all from all these extras uh, and to see if that is uh, really happening. So the mock is the uh, the most used uh, part, and is this uh, top. There's also a so-called stop role for mocks, and a stop role simply provides data. A stop could be s s uh, as simple as just a string, which provides information, or it could also be something like a scanner, which you feed a string, and then the scanner uses the string as input for the actual tokens that you get out whenever you do a get next, or a get next integer, or get next uh, whatever that you can do with the uh, with, uh, with a scanner. It, uh, it will not remember, at, and, and you're not uh, supposed to remember uh, what, uh, what interaction that really happened, because that is not, uh, not the way that a stop is meant to be. As far as Mokito uh, goes, uh, there's no distinction between the two things. Those in both cases, they are called mocks, and the way that they are generated is the same. The only thing is that you don't train it with uh, other interactions it's special interactions um, other than what they uh, already uh, provide. Uh, so uh, now that's that's not not quite right. You do train it. So if you would have a s say, you would have um, an input, then you will will tell it what to give back when the input method is being called. But you do not look at the verification because what you expect that the business class does 
it, uh, you expect it that it uses this, uh, this stub to provide data. And from the rest of the test results, you can inspect if it did indeed did the right things. We'll see that in a, in a second. That's on the website um, of PRC2 in, in this top. Uh, so, um, so we'll see that uh, in a minute. Um, the third thing is a spy. Sometimes um, your cl the class that you want to, um, to mock is quite complex and you are only interested in one specific interaction because you as a test designer, but also as the implementer of the method uh, that you want to test, know that there is a specific interaction that takes place uh, on an object. And the object itself might be big, it might be uh, already provided, um, and what you then would like to do is uh, just look at the specific interactions. Uh, so look at the parameters that are passed into a method and the return value that comes back so that you can see that the me business method indeed uses this, uh, this thing exactly as you want it to be used. Uh, but for the rest, let, the, uh, let that uh, dependent on component do its normal business. So this, de this dependent on component is a real pro uh, product, but the only thing is that you wrap um, uh, an object around it, which takes the parameters that goes in and reco records them, and also uh, takes the return value that is produced and records that as well, and but passes that return value back to the system under test. And that is what is called spying. You don't need that too often, and it's actually best uh, to try to avoid it, because it's uh, even more complex than all the other things combined. Now, having said that, there are also things that you shouldn't do and uh, in particular um, now you've seen what Mokito can do it doesn't imply that you should always use mocks um, but I must postpone that a little bit because let, let's go into in a concrete detail in which we use uh, this kind of mock now assume we have an abstract class or an interface like this we have a simple printer and that printer has a, a method that's called print line that's uh, for obvious reason it's a, a printer and that print line uh, takes a, 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 st a string to be printed so that's the information that needs to be printed and to big make it a bit more convenient uh, it also has a method that is called print line that takes now um, an object so this is a different signature and what it uh, what it does it simply invokes the method that is defined over here as an abstract method in the interface invokes it by doing uh, object to to string so that will produce a, a string and then then that string is uh, sent to um, the printer and then by this you can verify that this is all happening correctly now in your test class what you do is you create the printer object in such a way that you know exactly what it is mocking and how do you do that you use mockito.mock, which is a static method, and you can't see that can't see all of it, but uh, that's because of an import. So what you do is you mock the printer class, and now uh, Mokito knows, oh, this printer class has two methods, and uh, I can um, can use them and verify that uh, they have been invoked. And then what I, what you do is you make an instance of your business class. And because you do not want uh, this business class to make its own printers, but instead passing it as a printer in, uh, inside this constructor, uh, that is uh, what you do over here on this line. And then you have your business uh, class go about its business, so make it work, like, uh, like this one. That is the interaction that you want to test, that is to see if the business class uses the printer properly. And after that interaction, you verify, and in the verify statement, which is also part of the Mokito library, you verify that on the printer object the method print line has been uh, invoked and in this guy, case you do not really want uh, um, some value but you simply verify if any string has been passed so you see if some object has been passed in that has uh, type string so an empty string would be acceptable in this case but also a string with some kind of uh, content the only thing that you are uh, testing here that the business class indeed use the printer and not what it printed but that is a very simple test and in some cases that might be sufficient as a first test in your test driven design so you make a mock of the printer then you see give the printer to that uh, uh, business class then make it work and then verify that the printer has been used and then okay you know that the printer has been used and that is the first feature that you might want to implement so you can say okay this this now works 
Now, if you want to verify that the printer used printed something useful, then of course um, you must inspect what the printer has uh, has printed. Uh, uh, sorry, what the business class passed to the printer, not what the printer printed, because there's no real printer. The printer is small. This also, this also uh, introduced a variant of the previous example because here you see that this printing, this all this mocking takes place inside the test method, and in this case, in the second case, you see that this um, this printer is a field in the test class. So this is the body of the test class. This whole stuff, and by adding the mock annotation and a little bit of annotation in front of the test class. The Mockito will be able to look at all the fields that have been identified as mock and then uh, creates instances for those uh, mocked uh, classes and puts them in inside the field. So Mockito mix, uh, inserts uh, a printer in this case in this line, in one line number one. Of course, you also have a business class, but this business class is just a field. If you want to use it in this way, you must, of course, before you do a test, first initialize that it. And that happens over here in the before each method. So before each test is being executed, you create a new business class, and in that business class you provide it within, with the printer. And that is actually the printer that has been mocked. So in this way, in this small method, you provide the business class with the printer that you want it to use during your tests. Then inside uh, the actual test method, now we, uh, we call it does it print business, so we, uh, does it print the exact information that we want it to print. Um, what we do for that is we need an extra an helper class which is called an argument captor. And that argument captor, is, uh, its purpose is to capture the parameters that are passed into, uh, or the arguments that are passed into um, mocked uh, classes, so into mocked instances. And in this case, we will use that argument capture to, cap to capture the information that has been printed by the business class. We'll see that in a second. Now we have a business method that takes a parameter, and in this case it has a short string, a name of a person. And then uh, we uh, verify that indeed the printer has been used on the printer method, uh, print line method has been invoked, and it uses that line capture, cap captor which is defined as a line captor that uh, collects strings, the string parameters that are passed to the print line method, and collects them into a list. And, what, um, and afterwards, you can inspect that list of strings to see if it contains the value that you wanted it to, uh, to uh, print. This uh, line all values, so this uh, argument get all values method, simply produces a list of all the, uh, the strings in this case that have been collected and received by the printer object. And we know that this in this sim simple test case there's only one string to be printed and that string should con uh, contain the name of the person and then prefix with hello and a space. That is what the business uh, is all about. And then here you see the traditional way that I uh, complete a test method that uh, while I'm working with the test method and I'm not sure that it is complete, I keep this fail message in so that all the output that is produced by the test framework is visible in the, on, on my screen. And once I'm satisfied and the business uh, code is okay, then I can, can comment that line out. But you've seen the, me do that before. Talking about commenting out, that's an important thing. Let me go back to... Um, let me go back to, uh, let's have a look, to my IDE. I also have seen uh, quite a few times that students use, um, as I would call, a quite peculiar way of commenting out code. What they do is they type uh, star uh, something here and then have to look where the other star should go, something li like that. That is not a professional way to comment stuff. What you do is you press your shift key, the down arrow key, and then control slash. Then you comment out all the blocks that have been, uh, that need to be commented out from the first line that you selected until the last line uh, that you selected. And if you press control, back, uh, control slash again, yeah, you can toggle desk comment. For people that can't remember that, there is also an IDE icon for that, and that is in this editor uh, menu. This one is the comment thingy and the other one is the uncommon thingy 
so you see it actually does the same thing so if you do if you like these better then that uh, that is fine so normally if you comment out, want to comment out code temporarily always use uh, use that that style so selecting so you don't even have to be at the beginning of a line let's uh, put my curves over here if i shift uh, down uh, like so let's have a look then i can comment those lines out and that is the easiest and most reliable way to comment out stuff because otherwise you might catch the wrong information or miss a curly brace or whatever that is the way that you should try to work um okay let's go back to uh, to my firefox yes Oh, over here. So, um, where was I? I was here. So this is this is then the way that you uh, would uh, would would do this interaction. So mocking a printer, having business using it, set up the business with this specific printer, having a captor that uh, collects the arguments that have been passed to the printer, do the interaction, verify that uh, that the printing has. Uh, has, has taken place and then allow this capture captor to capture the information that has been collected and then verify with an assert or assert uh, that uh, this uh, captor uh, received the correct information so that the business printed the proper information to the thing now um, mocking is nice um, it has a few disadvantages one of the biggest uh, errors that we have um, seen made is that the students tend also to uh, to mock out the business class so they make a mock of the business class and then they uh, nicely write tests and they see if the mock works right and they uh, train the, the, that mock business class to do its work and what they effectively are testing is nothing because the business class is never involved in such a mock so that is put here as a warning this one this should be read as a very big warning a very common mistake is uh, using mocking as a, a testing technique is uh, faking the protagonist or the business the system under test that is wrong don't do that because what you are testing is not ac effectively nothing you want to develop a business class but in the test you are talking to something di completely distinct this or different it's a mock that you're talking to and not the actual um, business class so make sure that you do not mock your business class otherwise you are kidding yourself and that is not uh, not what you want to do. Um, so we had this about uh, mocking and stopping. Let's have a look. Uh, yes, it's not always the best idea to try to mock stuff. In particular, it's not the best idea if you have a have an already existing class like uh, system out for instance which is a print stream or a scanner which is a, scan a scanner but these these classes ha have many methods and if you would mock that uh, that class you might want to train a lot of methods and that is actually a lot of work for little value uh, f um, in particular because these classes can typically be configured in, a, in such a way that um, uh, that you can can configure it in such a way that it provides exactly the information that the tests need. The best example would be uh, the scanner example, and yeah, that's that's a bit above this one. Yeah, I should show that one first. No, this is the the scanner the scanner example um, because uh, the scanner uh, class, since I don't know wh which Java version, also allows you not just to scan input or a file. Uh, or the console or the, the way that a person uh, types but it can also simply scan a string so you can uh, provide the constructor of that scanner with a string which contains exactly the information that you want to provide to your business class for instance uh, your business class is an, ad an adder or calculator and you want it to, to sum up values and in this case you would simply provide that scanner with a string containing two numbers separated with uh, new lines and then the business would see two lines with uh, separated with uh, 
two numbers or as, uh, in, two, in two lines, and it will use that inside uh, the business code. And that is a, a perfect example of a stub, because this scanner only provides the data that the business class needs. You know that the business class uses the scanner, and you provided that scanner uh, inside a test, and later on in your business code, when the business class is being uh, instantiated, you provide it with a scanner. You have seen that, by the way, in the MOOC, because there are quite a few exercises which use a scanner, and you have been told that you should use that scanner inside the uh, uh, business code and don't make your own scanner. It is exactly this rule. Provide a scanner which is trained with uh, an actual scanner. It's not a mock, it's not uh, nothing to do with Mokito, but you can provide a scanner with a string, and that is actually sufficient configuration in this case to make sure that this, uh, this scanner uh, works. Um, the other thing is that output is sometimes also important and that would then be a mock because uh, when uh, business code does some kind of output, uh, like uh, printing to a printer, you want to verify that indeed the correct information has been passed. Now, if you start test driven or if you write tests for a test class that uses system out uh, or uses some kind of output like a print stream, you want, don't want to restrict it to only use specific methods uh, uh, because PrintStream has something in 33 methods or something like that. You don't want to, want to mock them all. What you simply want is to use this PrintStream as is, but afterwards being able to uh, capture the information that, uh, that this PrintStream has, uh, has, has seen as being printed. And in this case, um, what we do, this is our business class, that business class gets a print stream, which is of the same time as uh, same type as system out. We pass it in that uh, that um, print stream in one of its constructors. We do that in this second constructor. So this print stream is simply passed into this um, into this constructor and then set to uh, system out. And then in the business method, we use that field that print stream out to print. For instance, in this case, it wants to print a, a cash receipt. Uh, someone has uh, purchased a specific type of cheese for some price. Uh, so, Oplechka uh, is for nine euros fifty seven cents, and that is what you want to uh, what you want to print. And uh, now, in this case, if you use this constructor, you pass in a specific uh, output. So, in your test class, you can then verify that indeed this printer has uh, has received exactly the string that you wanted to, to see, or at least see the, f uh, the string uh, oplegkaas, you'll see the, the test in a minute, also 957 uh, as a string, and also these, these two letters at, because that is a uh, part of our forward string. In a typical normal case, the, the print business might use this uh, constructor that is a default constructor which takes no parameters that's the our parameterless uh, constructor and that simply sets this out to system out so that in in the normal case this uh, business class will simply print its business onto a system out so this is the way that you can do that and this is also again the trick that the uh, MOOC uses to test uh, that your programs uh, produce the proper output so it uh, replaces system output with some special printer, uh, some special print stream, and then collects this uh, information from the print stream. Um, the use in tests looks like this. You know, so you make a special kind of output. Let's call it console output. That is the way that this thing is, uh, is uh, being made. You'll see how this console output is implemented, but it is a subclass. Uh, it has to do with a uh, print stream. From that uh, console output, you can get a print stream. So that is the thing that uh, the business class can uh, um, print to. And then um, what I should have s written here is uh, invoke this business method. But instead, I've uh, written this. So um, we expect that the business code will print something with this format line. So this is not co completely correct test-wise. It should have called the business method over there. But anyway. Uh, then you can assert that uh, when you get from this console output this to string value, which is simply the collection of everything that has been uh, printed from the beginning of its existence until now, and then, then should contain 
uh, strings or a string that contains the word add, that's this one, and then oplegkaas, <laughs> there's a spelling error here as well because there is a space there and there's no one, none, none here. And also the, the, the digit string uh, 957, so 9 euros 57 cents for this piece of uh, cheese. And uh, that is how you can test this, this class. Now, um, to make such a class, I will not go in too much detail because you can simply read it from the website. If you look at the website, you, you see that there are a few things defined. First of all, we have an interface over here, which is used inside this console output. And this console output is simply a helper class that you can also put simply put in your collection of test utilities, the same as uh, a, a helper class to do your uh, equals and hash code uh, testing. You've seen that in, I think, week one or two as one of the test recipes. Simply copy and uh, copy this into your uh, test class or, and that might be even a better idea, I will publish the, the content of this project simply on the website so you can fetch it and use it uh, into your own projects. Um, so what, what actually is happening, it, uh, this console output takes a, a parameter of that interface that you've seen above. There's also one that takes uh, no parameters. Then uh, there's a method that you need to implement. And actually um, getting the print stream is this method, method that uh, takes the print stream, uh, prints to the object console output, puts the strings inside a nice array of uh, characters and um, so that you can inspect them later on and the two string uh, method simply outputs this uh, string of uh, characters as a standard string so it turns it into a string which we then can ins inspect into your um, test method you can uh, also use that to redirect uh, standard input and standard out standard error i should say those both are output channels from your standard output channels from your uh, java program because there are methods that allow you to set uh, the output value. System.setOut uh, and then passing in a print stream, which should not be nil of course, uh, is the way that you can uh, redirect a system out to print on such a console output, which you can then later on inspect for uh, in your tests. And again, this is, this is exactly what uh, the MOOC does to test all this stuff and to verify that what your program outputted is indeed what uh, the tests the, uh, require. So, in there are cases in which is it a better idea to use a real thing instead of a mock. Uh, and certainly avoid mocking your business class because that is completely, well, not off limits, but stupid because you're not testing your business class, you're testing the stand-in and you want to test the actual thing. And of course, there's a there's um, a test, uh, or, or I should say an exercise, my first mock, which looks very much like uh, the exercise that you've seen before. And it should be relatively easy to get this uh, working in the idea. This maybe is a nice rhyme, doc rhymes with mock. So uh, if you mock, it must be a dependent on component and don't use the sort for that because that is uh, that would be definitely wrong. The second important part and I must stress important part of this lesson is which we will do in say five minutes not ten minutes so let's ha have a short break of ten minutes and then go into the next part of this uh, of this class uh, Richard if you could stop the recording for a short time then we publish this in two parts and then uh, because otherwise uh, students have to skip to a long uh, long pause that's that's fine, but Frank has to do. But uh, okay, no. Frank, Frank can do that. Yeah. 